Another point worth reiterating, China produces about 600 metric tons of gold per year and has done for at least 20 years. So just do the math. None of that gold leaves the country. So that's 12,000 tons alone. And there are a couple of principal reasons because like all transitions, it doesn't happen overnight. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. And quite fortunate today to be joined once again by London Paul of the Sirius Report, who has been pretty far ahead of the curve in terms of the geopolitical events that are going on in the world that seemingly escalated in the last couple of years. Obviously, we still have the unfortunate war going on in Ukraine, which amazingly is about to enter year two with perhaps not many signs of resolution in sight, yet we've seen the de-dollarization and the splitting up of the world continue to increase. Amidst that, we have flows of gold and resources continuing to head east, which sets up some unfortunate dynamics, although glad to have Paul on the line today to dig into a lot of these things and try and make sense out of what is going on out there. So, Paul, it's great to have you back on the show today. Happy New Year, my friend, and how are you today? Well, Happy New Year, Chris, and obviously to everyone listening. Yeah, very well, and it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, so, and how are you? Doing well. Uh, it's nice to have a start of a new year, sometimes a little less than ideal to just follow some of these trends that continue where we see resources continue now to shift east the u.s continue to isolate itself to the west <clears throat> amidst all this we've seen for a decade or so gold flowing east and perhaps we could start there because uh in the last couple of months we did see china acknowledge some more gold reserves i know that you and many others think they have a lot more gold than they acknowledge. And what do you think is the, as a starting point, what do you think is the end game that is behind all of this accumulation of gold? And now as we're seeing talk about a, a, a commodity or currency backed by a basket of commodities, obviously none of this is written in stone, but what do you see as the major shift there and and the the plan with all of that gold going forward yeah i mean first off you're absolutely right just to i mean i've mentioned this before but yeah the the gold shifting west to east is being very pronounced since 2012 particularly uh not entirely was going on before but i've made the point before that for two and a half years a thousand metric tons a month went from west to east, east meaning China and Hong Kong, you know, that's 30,000 tons. Another point worth reiterating, China produces about 600 metric tons of gold per year and has done for at least 20 years. So just do the math, none of that gold leaves the country. So that's 12,000 tons alone. And the big accumulation in, in, in not just solely in the east, because we have seen like Poles buying it, the Hungarians, but a lot of it's in the global South nations that have been accumulating gold. And there are a couple of principal reasons because like all transitions, it doesn't happen overnight. There has to be a process where if you want to de-dollarize, you're not going to immediately go, well, I know, uh, we just, we'll just announce tomorrow we're going to have a gold back to Iran and that'll be the end of the problem. Uh, that's not how it works. So the, the initial aim is to say, okay, we want to trade less in the dollar and and trade in local currencies. And this has been self-evident where, for example, the rupee, the Indian currency got hammered against the dollar. So for India, trading in dollar terms was, was highly inflation, very, very damaging. So they went, were possible, let's trade in local currency. We can trade with the Russians. Okay, the Russian angle is because of sanctions, but we can trade in local currencies. We can do it with, dear ones, with the, the UAE. And they want to encourage other nations to trade in local currencies. Why? Because it irons out the huge problems they have with, with, with the rising dollar against their currencies. Local currencies means you, you eliminate a lot of these problems. Also, 
the argument is they, they get around the sanctions problem because they're all fearful now they could be sanctioned equally. But the first step is trading local currencies. But the other thing, by accumulating huge amounts of gold, it's getting out of the dollar. Let's not hold treasuries or dollars. Let's hold, let's hold physical gold. The other point to that is because in the long term, they see a return to sound money. Okay, exactly how that works because everybody goes, oh, it has to be how it was in the past. We have to have this gold standard. Well, the gold standard failed, so you can't do it in the future. Well, no, it doesn't have to be along those lines. You could have, for example, to make, like, let's take China and Russia, and they will ebb and flow, and they'll have trade deficits and trade surplus, and they can settle that in local currencies, but they could also go, well, actually, we can convert that into gold. And they don't have to keep shipping gold all over the world because they trust each other. So they'll go, okay, here's a credit in, in the Chinese vaults or a credit in the Russian vaults for 100 tons, 50 tons, whatever. That's one way of, of effectively saying, well, you can set in local currencies, but ultimately it's fully convertible into gold because gold is real money. So that is the basis also is why would you want to get out the dollar? Because the United States unfortunately made the fatal mistake. Okay, this isn't about saying Russia was justified in fighting the Ukraine war. It's a simple fact. They said, let's sanction the Russian central bank and steal their forex reserves. Well, the rest of the world in the global south is going hang on. We could be next. The Saudis are going, do we want to be holding dollars? No. Do, do the, well, the Iranians hardly do anyway because they're totally sanctioned, but Middle Eastern nations, uh, African nations, Southeast Asian nations are going, I don't think we really want to be holding dollars or we want, so it accelerated the move out of where possible and it's, you can't do it overnight where you can trade with each other in non-dollar terms where it's possible and that's accelerating very quietly but very rapidly and nations are buying up with, if they've got trade uh, surpluses they're, they're, they're then going to convert it into gold and they're keeping quiet yeah, some nations advertise that they've been buying gold, but others are going, just keep quiet about it. Just accumulate gold, don't tell anyone. And everyone always goes, but this data, the IMF data or whoever's data doesn't show this. Well, why are they going to tell the world what they're doing? I mean, there is the there is this transparent gold market and there's the opaque gold market. And the opaque gold market is where the major trades happen that no one sees, no one's aware of. So China goes and buys two, three hundred tons of gold in 2022. And it's a matter of national security. So it gets shoved in their strategic reserves where they they store all the real gold that they hold, that the West has no visibility on. That that's constantly going on. And it's not just sovereign nations, there's high net worth individuals. Not extensively, but to some degree, who are buying up gold as well because they want to get out of fiat currency because they perceive problems that most institutional investors still don't recognize as a problem because they're going, well, what's the problem? The Dow's at 34,000. Right. Interest rate rises haven't blown anything up. And there's this irony in the West where they, where they go, but real interest rates are positive. Why would you want to hold gold? Well, if you think holding gold, Gold relates to the fact it's a neutral asset. In the current climate, you're missing the complete point of all the failures we've had since 2008 and why they're constantly trying to mask those failures by printing money, secretly bailing out banks, doing whatever they can to keep this farcical Western financial system going. So, yeah, it's a, it's a natural consequence they're looking to the future. And you mentioned BRICS is a good example. It's, it's a stated intention, and they will do this. And the West goes, oh, it's impossible. They can't do this. But the BRICS nations and BRICS Plus, because there's a whole bunch of other nations wanting to join, can pool their real resources, their real tangible assets, their commodities, and then they can weight the currency accordingly on the basis of the commodities, and they can form a BRICS currency it'll be a digital currency okay people get bent out of shape about digital currencies but 
This is for wholesale and international trade. And you can have gold, a gold component in this. Okay, at this point, we don't understand exactly how it how it will work, but in a broad sense, what I've just said is correct. So there's a natural tendency to go, the future's about commodities. It's about real assets. It's about generating real wealth, and it's about having a financial system that is actually fit for purpose. So nations do learn to live within their means. Global South used to this. They're, they're, they, they're not used to living in a system which is, hang on, we've got a bit of a problem here. Just print a few trillion dollars and with it. So they, they, they just want the opportunity to be able to build their economy without having the problems of SWIFT, the IMF, and the World Bank, and, and, and being able to do it with other like-minded nations. So, so holding gold as well means we're not holding fiat currency. The, the West can't attack us. The United States, what are they going to do? Steal physical gold we have in the vaults in our own country? They can't do that. It's impossible. So it's a, it's as much as that also preserving their, their forex reserves or their reserves effectively, but for future proofing for what they know is coming down the track, but also protecting themselves from being vulnerable to san being sanctioned by the US, which in recent years is just a sanction junkie. If something doesn't go right, well, let's just sanction this nation. Let's just sanction these individuals. I mean. The the argument is what have they got left to sanction in Russia? Nothing. And they and they and they still haven't learned sanctions don't work. But anyway, that's we're digressing. So that's the kind of basis of why you'd want to hold gold, but it's not exclusively gold. We've seen India in twenty twenty two buy literally a third near, of global annual silver production. It's all in it's all in in India now. And it, nations are wanting to buy a strategic metals. This is what China did, and I reported on my own podcast in 2020 and 2021. They were just hoovering up every single strategic metal they could get their hands on, shoving it in, in, in the strategic reserves. No one knows what it is. No one knows they've been buying it for very obvious reasons, because the future is about those who have the commodities and those who don't. And the Global South can expand its commodity footprint enormously because there's a lot of nations who do have commodities, but they've never had the ability to uh, exploit those commodities uh, because they've been hampered by the Western financial system. They've been hampered by fear of upsetting the United States. Well, now they feel liberated. They feel like we don't need to be part of, of this uh, this uh, Western empire anymore. And we're not fighting you. We've just got an alternative and we're going to develop it. And certainly precious metals will be a component of that. To what extent? We don't know because the Ukraine war changed everything. It changed the perspective of, you know, BRICS. BRICS was always going to develop, but it's now developing and accelerating in its development significantly greater than we could have anticipated because nations have gone. We don't want to get sucked in to into a, a sanctions war with, with the United States where they cut off our central banks, steal our forex reserves and cripple us. So that changed the emphasis. And also there was an understanding. Why did Russia survive? Because they had all these resources. They were able to force the West into buying energy in rubles because we have the energy. We have the resource. And they went, hang on, you can back your currency with these resources because it's a tangible asset. So it kind of changed people's perspective a lot, on, which is not surprising. I mean, it wasn't something we I mean, there was a lot of talk for a long time that you know, there could be a war with Ukraine, but no one could have envisaged what the, the West reaction to that would be. Although it wasn't wholly unsurprising that they cut banks off and swim to some degree. But for me, the, when they went for the central bank, it was whoever made that decision, a rubber stamp, it was probably one of the most stupid decisions the United States has ever made. Because in essence, they were just taking a gun, pointing at their own head, the torso, the arm, everyone just shooting themselves multiple times. Because they didn't realize the ramifications wouldn't be, we're all 
to support you in, in this fight against Russia. They turned around and went, hang on, we're now in we're now in your crosshairs. You'll you you could do it to us. And the Chinese and the Russians have been warning these nations for years this might happen. So of course when it happens, it reinforces that perspective. So hence why we've seen in in twenty twenty two a big move for nations in the Middle East. You know, Turkey did it in the in the Far East. The Stan Republic's going, we just want to buy as much gold as we can get our hands on. Because they're then going, will that protect us from that aspect? But also, yeah, we can now see on the horizon new ways of, of transacting in like a BRICS currency, which would be commodity back. And therefore, it's advantageous now to get out of the dollar system and fiat currencies as fast as possible because you don't want to get, you can't avoid it. It's impossible to shield yourself from the fallout of the problems the Western financial system's having. But to some degree, you can you know, protect yourself from some of the fallout from it by taking those steps, which we've just you know, highlighted. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I continue to wonder if 10 or 20 years from now, we won't be looking back at that move to kick Russia out of SWIFT as really a, a bit of a turning point, because like you said, it creates that dynamic where if you're another country out there that doesn't get along with the u.s now or potentially in the future gee sit there thinking could we be next and like you said it seems as if business in the u.s on the surface continues as normal whereas we see these shifts happening behind the scenes which continue to accelerate <clears throat> and Something I heard you mention in another call that you did with Andrew McGuire recently that was interested to hear a little bit more about. You mentioned that in 2016, China was actually close or considering going to a gold backed yuan, and they were told by the US, if you do that, we'll consider it an act of war. Hadn't heard that before and was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, it was, it was kind of, we, I mean, we don't want to get into, every aspect but you you could see some strange market movements in 2015 late 2015 early 2016 and i remember saying to someone uh who sadly no longer with us in, on planet earth and they passed away a few years ago but i got in touch with them and said look something big's happening you th there's something going on and they said to me well Look, China's proposing to, to launch a goal back to Japan, but unsurprisingly, the United States is not very happy about this, clearly. And they said to them, look, you know, this is a declaration of war. And at that time, the Chinese went, OK, we're going to have to back off from this and walk away from it. But what it demonstrates is the Chinese have had this intention, and I've known this for over a decade, that they were that was the end goal. And it goes back to the point when what I call, and I'm, I'm rephrasing this now, I'm talking about the architects of multipolarity. It's a better way. When you mention the word reset, people, people get, like, get very upset because they think it means something to do with some other reset they think the World Economic Forum's implements, which, of course, is not implemented, and it will never implement. But the point is, so I call it the architects of multipolarity, and they... They went to the Chinese and the Russians because the West wouldn't listen to them and said, look, the days of the Western financial system are coming to an end. We don't know exactly when, but we think in the next 10, 20 years, it's game over. And they took it seriously. And part of the thing was, we need to, to have alternative financial system. You need to resurrect the, the old Silk Road from the new Silk Road, the Belt Road Initiative or the One Belt Road. And you need to start making plans for, for a post-dollar world. And whereas the West laughed it off like they're laughing it off now, they took it seriously. So one of those aspects was China went, well, in the future, we, we'll probably want to back our currency with gold. They may, they probably still will do that. But I mean, times change. Maybe they, they, they'll back it in some other way, but logically it's back it with gold. Maybe, maybe the Russians will back the ruble with gold. Uh, but And there's kind of hints about this coming out in the last year or so where the Chinese came out and went, 
Gold will be an important component of the future financial system. Just this little throwaway remark made by a government official in a very low-key meeting. But that when they come out with public statements, which it was public, it's very much indicative of the fact that, yeah, the, just be aware that's the intention. And, and Russia's talked recently uh, and advises to Putin about the importance of gold and why gold will be important, and it's been important historically, and it will be important in the future. So these plans were a long time in the, time in the making. I think the Chinese may have felt this 2015-16, there was, things were a bit precarious. There was a lot of concerns privately about the stability of the Western financial system. Once again, what a surprise. It keeps rearing its head every year or two years. And they went, it probably just went, Hang on, we need we need to consider doing this, and they they kind of obviously did talk to the the Americans about it, which is probably a good thing. But the difference now is why they they're confident of doing it in the future is because militarily they've now realised that that was a bluff call. The United States threatened China because in reality they weren't going to go to war with China because it's World War Three. But they did enough to bluff the Chinese into thinking, hang on, there's no way we can we can take that risk. But but it's like now the United States isn't trying to bluff the Russians into anything because militarily the United States doesn't want World War Three, and it's made it very clear consistently why it won't cross red lines that both nations understand with each other. And, and therefore, the dynamics change, the world's changed, multipolarity has developed enormously since 2016, but particularly, you could argue, in the last 18 months, maybe two years. And, and therefore, the dynamics shifted hugely. And, and, and therefore, that is a realistic proposition. It hasn't gone away. It's just the timing was not great. Probably wasn't. You know, a wise decision to to have mentioned it as they did at the time, but they did mention it. Uh, but it signaled their what their intentions were, which have been long standing. And of course, the West just doesn't grasp this. Why? 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 They, their attitude is: Why would a nation who wants the world reserve currency back their currency with gold? Well, China doesn't want the world reserve currency. There won't be a world reserve currency in the future. But here's the thing. If you want to trust nations to hold your currency, what's the be what better than backing your currency with gold? People feel confident about it. They th you know they'll they'll think it's re that, that you, you know it's a reliable currency to hold. Okay, there's the argument about pricing oil in yuan, but the Chinese told the world in 2016 it's fully convertible into gold. This is not a mystery. It's reality, and of course it comes back to the point. They talked to the Chinese in 20, early 2016, around the time the whole gold back to when uh, conversation with the Americans happened. They went to, to Riyadh and went, we need a petro yuan. And the Saudis went, yeah, fine. But we've got to be careful. Obviously, you know, it could create an enormous political shitstorm if we just then went out it today or tomorrow. But yeah, eventually that will become established and Saudi do trade and have done since 2018 in a very small way in petro yuan contracts just to demonstrate it's viable and that you know you can accept rmb but it's fully convertible into gold and, and of course the statement always comes out oh it's not possible for china to back their currency with gold they don't have enough gold i mean they have 40,000 tons and china can go and say we're resetting the gold price to this. Then we back our currency. I mean, this is just simple math. There's, there's no rocket science to this. So that's what underpins that whole story in the past. It wasn't just wishful thinking. Uh, it very much was something that they were thinking years before that, and hence why they, they went to the Saudis. They talked about de-dollarization. They talked about how China could bankroll Saudi's future desires to, in a post-hydrocarbon world from a Saudi perspective, which is why why do we see in, in a matter of months after that big visit uh, by the Chinese, 
The Saudis come out with Vision 2030. This is our way out of the hydrocarbon world. Who does the world think is going to finance that? The Americans? No, the Chinese. So it's all you see. These are all these pieces of the puzzle. They're all there. People and the people just need to understand these things happen for reasons and chronologically in time they all fit together and they fit together for a reason. And that for me is what the most important thing I do is go. I know in a broad sense what the plans were for multipolarity in 2012. In a broad sense, they haven't changed, but there's changes along the way in the, in the last decade. But it's seeing those times when this meeting happens, what happens as a, in, as a result of that meeting. It's like the one between the Saudis and the Chinese you know, at the end of the year, in December 2022. You'll start to see the fallout of that. You'll start to see developments. And it's very all-encompassing. It's about investing in, in in Saudi Arabia. It's about upstream, downstream um, projects working together. It can be the Saudis will, will take part in a project where China wants to extract oil from the South China Sea, as an example. Yeah. Also, it means Saudis get a bunch of RMB because they're selling oil to, to the Chinese. And everyone goes, but what can they do with the RMB? Well, it's very obvious. Here you go, China. You're investing in in Vision Twenty. Here's a bunch of RMB. We'll pay for the project that you're investing in with this RMB. You've got your RMB back. Everyone's happy. The Saudis are happy because they've got an investment, and it's this kind of a lack of. It's not rocket science. It's very simple way of conducting business between two nations. What have you got that I want? What have I got that you want? You've got the investment. We need the investment. You've got the oil. We'd like the oil. And and we can develop other projects. We, we've got access to commodities. And here's the thing. You know, this is why it's very advantageous for the Russians, because they can go to the world and go, do you know what? We've got the one thing you desperately need, cheap energy, which is why... China's inflation rates 1.8 percent because they get abundance of that cheap energy from the Russians. Who else provides the world with dirt cheap energy? The Iranians. Who's upset? The Iranians and the Russians. The Americans, and by 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 extension, the Europeans. So they're going. Well, you're not having our cheap energy. We'll sell the cheap energy to the global south. The global south's going great. We get an abundance of cheap energy. That allows us to develop our nation because without affordable energy, you can't produce anything. It's the lifeblood of the nation. And this isn't rocket science. It's very simple thinking. And the West gets all bent out of shape, thinks things aren't possible. But it's very possible and it's already being implemented. And it's only going to continue to be implemented. And the West needs to turn around and ask itself, hang on, we need to start taking this seriously. Because in the end, the global South, which is 88% of the world's population, where all this huge vertical growth sectors, and they're in a phase of their economic growth where, it's like I always say, for the West to flourish now that, the United States would have to pay Chinese wages to be competitive with China. It can't do that under its current economic financial structure because it blow everything up. How does it pay those wages to be competitive? Well, these nations are competitive because they can pay those wages and people can afford to live and they've got scope to pay people and to raise the standard of their economy. And, and and they've got the potential to grow. They're not maxed out in consumption terms. They're not maxed out in terms of, of destroying their financial system with all manner of financialization of economies, which was a total disaster and should never have been implemented. They have all this material advantage. And the West is going, but we've got what we've got. Well, what have we got? Endless money printing, financialization of economy. We've gutted our industrial base. We, we, we've reached saturation in consumption. I mean, how much more can we consume? How much more can we afford to consume? I mean, we can't raise wages anymore because if we 
And if we keep raising wages, we become less and less economically competitive. But if we're not, if we don't raise wages, we're going to be crushed by inflation. I mean, we're just sucked in this cycle where we we can't get out of this unless we, dare we use the word reset, but we have to go, how do we reset everything so we can compete on a level playing field with 88% of the world po- world's population where the next 50, 100 years belongs to Asia. And very soon in the next few decades, Africa, the Middle East, basically most of the rest of the world, they can function without us. They don't need us anymore. We need them. We just haven't woken up to the reality we desperately need them in the future. Why? Because we're going to need cheap energy. So who do we get cheap energy from? The very nations we loathe and despise and don't want anything to do with and tell the world, you know, they're either terrorist states or they're, you know, they're nations that, uh, that are a threat to us. And we can't function on that basis. So at some point, we do have to have the realization that we might not want to do this, but we're going to have to be mature adults and accept the fact that in Bretton Woods might, is not necessarily the right word, but we have to sit down with our adversaries and nations we loathe and despise and go, okay, the game's up. We accept that. What are we going to do and how can you help us? But we're so far off that but the longer the West continues this idea that we don't need cheap energy. We, we, we can just keep doing what we're doing. We can bully the rest of the world into submission and, and you'll do as you're told and you'll give us everything we want. And we know the world doesn't want dollars anymore. It won't buy US treasuries. So how's the US going to finance its, its free lunch in the future? By printing money, well, if you keep printing money, your free lunch becomes very expensive very rapidly. This is the predicament the West finds itself in, and it won't accept that, that they've caused their own problems and they've, they've created a geopolitical environment where they're deeply unpopular in the world. And the world's been very upset about this for a long time, but they're finally going, we've got the Chinese and the Russians on our side. And we've got the Iranians on our side. And hang on, what's happening? The Saudis and the Iranians are getting together, going, it's time to be friends again. Let's work together. And the West is going, what? What the hell is happening? How can this be possible? These are adversaries. No, they've woken up and gone, what's the point? We're never going to agree on everything. We don't have to agree. But the sum of our parts is going to be infinitely greater than being hostile adversaries. Bear in mind, we're hostile adversaries because the Americans have told us to hate each other for decades. Let's stop all this. So these are the kind of fundamental shifts we're seeing. But the large part of the West doesn't see any of this, and they don't even understand why it's significant. But it's hugely significant. Yeah, it's not an ideal trend, especially when you see countries that thought they were enemies banding together just because they want to overcome the current system that we have here and certainly not headed in an ideal direction uh and obviously people wonder often how long does this go on for it time seems as if we're seeing it unfold in slow motion well that is part one of this interview with london paul where obviously dug into more of the gold side and What China is actually looking at and thinking about doing with the gold that they've been accumulating and certainly as the financial system in the West being based more on paper and the money printing sets up a dynamic that is certainly not ideal for the Western nations, but appreciate everything that Paul shared there as he laid out pretty clearly what's going on. Interview went a little bit long, so we'll have part two coming up shortly where he talks a bit more about the dynamics in silver and that'll be coming your way in a few days. Before we wrap up, would like to thank Raina Silver, who brought us today's video. Did have some news out from Raina this morning as they have completed their agreement on their Medicine Springs option acquisition. Uh, I mentioned on the show a couple weeks ago that they had made an agreement to acquire 100% interest in their Medicine Springs project. Previously had been 80%. And as Jorge Romero Monroy of Reina mentions, as initial drilling continues to increase their confidence in Medicine Springs, 
They're happy to have acquired the 100% interest. And you can just click on this video that's coming your way now to find out a little bit more about that.